talk about a little project that I've done with some friends in Melbourne called Silo today, which is, I'm really proud of, it's tiny, it's only 45 square metres and that in itself has become a bit of a problem because a lot of people are complaining that they can't get in and what I'm really proud of is that everybody wants to stay and experience because one thing that annoys me the most is this obsession with this takeaway, which is, you know, people are walking all around the world now with takeaway cups everywhere, we, we were just talking about that this morning that, you know, the idea of, you, can, you can't imagine going to Milan and watching the Italians walking around with takeaway coffee cups because they just, why do you have a coffee? Because you're catching up with a friend and you're having a coffee, you know, even if it's only for five minutes. So even though we do have takeaway coffee at Silo, that's the only really, the only waste that we create, which I think is pretty, pretty amazing. So this is um, Jeff Proven, who owns the building, offered my business partner, Danny Coles, this site. He said, I've got a little spot for you. And Danny and I, for quite a few years, have been talking about creating a venue that generates no, no rubbish at all. And it's easier said than done, but I love the idea that when you've got no bin, just get rid of the bin, then all of a sudden you need to look at everything that generates waste. And <clears throat> I'll start with that crate down there, the black crate. My brothers import those crates and they've been importing them for over probably 25 or 30 years. They're used around the world to import bulbs, onions, garlic, and in Australia, there's literally hundreds of thousands of those crates on farms everywhere because nobody really knows what's, what to do with them. If I was to go to a plastics company to get that manufactured, it would have cost me $12 to make that crate. It's made from 100% recycled plastic. I can buy those crates for 50 cents. And what we did at Silo is all our suppliers, we gave them those crates. We said, if you want to supply us, you've got to supply us in those crates. So we just si simply made the, whether it's eggs, we found plastic crates that fit inside the, those plastic crates. They stack, and it's great. So people come and deliver stuff to us, and they just take the crates back, and it's just this ongoing cycle. Another, and you can imagine, like if you go to Coles and, and Safeway now, um, Chip has been working with coal. I think it was Coles that did it first. You notice those black plastic crates, and they're also made from recycled plastic, but they actually um, fold down. And I remember speaking to Coles, I think it was about four or five years ago, and they said, oh, we still, we still think it's more environmentally friendly to have cardboard boxes because, you know, they go flat packed and, you know, you've got to send them back. And I thought, surely that's not true. I mean, most, most growers have got trucks. You've got a truck driving up empty to pick up a load of apples or a load of lettuce. Surely it's just as easy to get a system happening where a truck doesn't leave empty, just leaves with empty crates and then, you know. And I'm really, I think it's quite exciting that, you know, the two big supermarkets are now, you know, if you supply Coles a Safeway with fresh produce, you have to supply it in their plastic crates. Um, actually, I'll go back. Another system here, I've got another photo of it, I think, is, I'll just run through this. So this system here is kind of cool because it means that we no longer need plastic bottles. So in Sydney, when I did the greenhouse a couple of years ago, I was on the radio talking about the build, and the next morning there's a guy standing at the gate, and oh, can I just talk to you for a minute? I heard you on the radio yesterday, my wife has made me drive all the way into Sydney I want you to try my milk. Okay, he was an organic dairy farmer and he was, kind of, he was struggling, you know, to sell his milk and to get a premium for it. And he decided to go outside of the co-op and try and sell milk direct. So I said to him, love the milk, but I want it in 20 litre buckets. So he supplied us in 20 litre buckets. He's now at capacity and supplies Rockpool and lots of other restaurants that tried the milk at the greenhouse and loved it. What came out of that, a couple of guys heard about the the what I was doing, you know, I was basically, it was kind of illegal, you know, I was just siphoning off milk and putting it in, because I thought, this is just crazy, we need to have these bottles in. But these guys have invented this system that pumps out the milk out of a 
large container. So just to give you an example, in Perth we use almost, a th at the greenhouse in Perth, we go through a thousand litres of milk a week. That's 500 plastic bottles that, that we would throw into a recycling bin that would then get recycled and add to the recycled plastic shit that no one's interested in because it's so cheap to make plastic from virgin plastic. So just compound the whole, you know, problem even more. No, no waste. We basically bought these stainless steel kegs. I think they came from Italy, these 20 litre stainless steel kegs. And that's how Shields Dairy filled them up. They wash them out, they fill them up. We get 10 kegs, they, pick, they take 10 kegs back to the dairy. I mean, you know, restaurants and cafes, it's so simple to, to stop generating waste just in, in milk alone. Another benefit is that you're not opening and closing a fridge 500 times a day to get the milk out. So the milk arrives cold, we put it in the fridge, we put the hoses in and that's it. You might have to open the fridge another time to change the hoses into, because they sort of bank. That's, you, you're not losing any energy, especially when it's 40 degrees or when it's hot. Opening and closing the fridge, it's just adding even more pressure and making more, you know, creating, using more energy. Another system that I'm really proud of to be involved in is the Hepburn Springs mineral water, um, uh, keg mineral water. And Mitch and his uh, partner, you know, took a big risk when I said in Sydney I wanted it in kegs. And I didn't realise at the time, he didn't tell me, but they invested almost $50,000 to try and put mineral water into a keg. I said, I can't just put it in kegs, I don't want it bottles. And he told me two weeks ago, for the first time, he sold more mineral water in kegs than in bottles. So within two years, that whole environment's changed. People want local mineral water now, and they want it in bulk. Why, why have all these glass bottles that we, again, need to recycle? And, you know, there's also... People think, oh yeah, I'll put my glass to the recycling. There is a massive overs oversupply of recycled glass. Eastlink had a base of glass. Vizzy had so much recycled glass, crushed recycled glass, glass that they ended up selling it to Eastlink and it was used as road base. So, uh, you know, we don't need to create this stuff. If we don't need, if we don't, if we can go without creating this stuff, well then, let's try and do it. So, just to give you an example, somebody like Rockpool would probably throw out a thousand bottles of empty mineral water every night. And then if you, Add to that that a lot of it's Italian, which is even more crazy. So why not have it in bulk, put it in a reusable keg? And then this little tap system here, we've got, I think that says white wine on the right. So we've got a great local biodynamic wine on tap. <clears throat> it's probably one of Phil Sexton's or somebody's um, innocent bystanders. And then we've got a red. So we've got one white, one red. red. We've got mineral water and we've got um, a beer and a cider, usually Moscato. So we've got six taps. So we don't have a lot of choice, but we change it all the time. You know, like if you don't, yeah, it, people just, people are cool with that. And I love that idea too. So if you think about wine, most winemakers can't afford a bottling plant. Even quite large winemakers don't have a bottling plant. So what do they do? They send their wine to a bottling plant. The biggest and most efficient bottling plants in Australia are in South Australia. So you're growing wine in Victoria, you're sending it to South Australia, get bottled, get sent back to you, and then you distribute it out. To supply wine in a keg means that any winemaker can supply it in a keg, straight to you. So there's a huge saving for the wine grower, and it also means a direct sale, just like the milk. By having bulk milk, it also means that all of a sudden the opportunities open up for people to start supplying milk um, direct from farms. They don't have to send it to a bottling plant, because for the same reason, most dairy farmers can't afford to spend a couple hundred grand on a bottling plant, but they can pasteurise it and put it in kegs and start selling it direct. Um, so yeah, this, this um, system here, in, for you know, a busy restaurant that does a thousand covers a day, you're talking about three or four wheelie bins a day of rubbish that you save, just by just what I've discussed, discussed up till now. <clears throat> this is, there's a whole bunch of reasons why I stone grind flour. The number one reason is that, you know, the farmers go, the farmers in the soil provide this amazing thing called wheat, rice, barley, oats, you know, full of life and full of 
you know, a, a grain of wheat that's got over 25 vitamins, minerals, oils, all these things that sustain us and keep us good. If you plant oats on the sickest soil, it looks great for the first three or four weeks. Why? Because it's completely relying on what's in that seed. It doesn't take anything from the soil until its tap root is down. So what have we done in the last 70 years? We have denatured, taken almost anything that's good out of the wheat so that we can trade it, turn it into a commodity, we can store it. So for the last 70, 80 years, we've been eating flour that's processed and it's making us sick. Never before in the history of us, of human beings, have we had such a problem with eating grain. It is because we've taken, we've turned it into something that our bodies don't understand and we've taken all the goodness out of it and we've, it fills us up. But all the goodness that's in it is gone. If you take an oat and you roll it fresh and you put it under the microscope, it's full of life. All you see is activity. And within 15 minutes of it being rolled and oxygen, half of it's gone. Within 24 hours, most of the life of that oat is gone. So when you buy a box of rolled oats, that is, it's like eating cardboard. There's not much left in it. There's three or four elements left out of the 28, 29 that were in it when it was growing. So that's why I obsess in the restaurants that we've got about fresh milling. Grain is at its best eight hours after it's been uh, uh, wheat. So what we do is we, we stone ground wheat and we um, use the sourdough process. So it's usually 12 hours, and then we bake it. You get all the goodness that, that was in that grain when it was growing, and then you get all the goodness into you. It fills you up. It has everything that, that um, human beings know we need to digest it. It's got all the elements already there. So a, f a good friend of mine who's a philosopher Quantz is a very smart guy. We got drunk one night, and he could not believe that you could make bread out of water and wheat. I said, well, what else would you need? He said, oh, you must need other stuff. I go, no, he didn't believe me. The next day he called me, I've Googled it, you're right, you can make bread out of water and... And that, you know, I think we've just lost the simple things and we've lost an appreciation for it. If you go back 100 years in the UK, there were still 10,000 mills milling wheat. We traded grain, we never traded flour. You couldn't trade flour because it would go off. That was a fundamental principle of flour. You never traded it because it went rancid. So what we invented was a way of killing the goodness and the life in it so that it didn't go off and we could store it and trade it. That's why when we send flour, bags of flour to Africa, they get sick because most Africans still stone milled their own flour. So that's one reason. The other reason is that it, all the packaging that you come, if you order muffins, you order... Um, all these things that you order for your restaurant come in packaging. If you stone, we, we stone grind and make everything from scratch. So the amount of packaging and stuff that's, that, that we save is huge. The wheat bags are paper because the grain's alive. You can't store it in a sealed bag. So the paper bag just go into the dehydrator, which I'll talk about in a minute. So there are a whole bunch of reasons why we stone grind everything fresh. And you know, my hope and my dream is that in five to 10 years time, you walk into any bakery in a city like Melbourne or and you sit in, you can get freshly milled food again. And you go into a cafe, you order porridge or oats, and they're, they're, you know, they're making them fresh because that's, we really, we obsess about our coffee, but we don't obsess about the things that are actually really important. What do you have, 60 grams of coffee a day? Imagine how much we eat in grain or you know, how much we have in flour. It's much more important to us, but we don't treat it with that same importance, which I find bizarre. Um, it leads me on to another thing that we were talking about just before. I mean, this is a bread. This is Powlett Hill, grown just near the Grampians, biodynamic, family-owned business. They deliver the wheat to us, and we stone grind it, and that's the bread. The butter's made by Douglas from the Shields milk. Um, honey, I've got half a dozen hives on the farm up in Monbog, so it's honey from my farm, and what a great breakfast. This is um, green eggs with uh, foraged greens and other, and leeks, great dish from Douglas, who's a chef at Silo. Um, this is a beetroot soup, again with house-made bread. And the, the reason why I've got the terracotta, I've got some friends that are making all the terracotta pots and plates, because I'm trying to make people get that connection again with, you know, with, 
growing. So it's all about, for me, it's about growing. And, um, where am I going with this? So the soy milk, this is a great story. Um, Lockie, who's our barista, and we were just talking about this, so I wasn't going to talk about it, but I've just been reminded, but Lockie is our barista. Um, well, when we open, I called Synovus and I called Bonsoy and a whole bunch of people and I said, look, we're opening this cafe without a bin. Can we get your product in bulk, you know, in a reusable can? Okay, so I said to Lockie, no soy. We're just having the Shields dairy milk and, that, and that's it. So after about a week, he says, oh, there's this... You know, there's some really beautiful women that come in asking for soy, and they're just walking away, you know. So, well, I'm sorry, but there's no soy. So two weeks later, I would come back in, and he's giving me a coffee with milk, because I normally have long black, and, and it's soy. I said, I told you, no soy. And he said, I made it. And he went on the internet and found out how to make soy milk. So he went to the Queen Vic Market, bought soybeans, and fermented and made his own soy milk. Now he's making 30 litres of soy milk every day. And how good is that? I mean, that, again, stemmed from the fact that I can't, I can't have rubbish. But, he, you know, that he would never have got to that conclusion if we, I mean, if Bonsoy would have said, yeah, no worries, I would have. But I think they're making a big mistake because I believe there's a half dozen cafes now doing soy milk because of, what Lock, because of Lockheed's initiative. I know in Perth we're making it. How good is that? I mean, you know, and it's costing us 30 cents in materials a litre. Yeah, there's work in it, but the, the beauty of the fact that the, the, the baristas actually made the soy milk as well on site, I think is great. And, you know, that's... A lot of, lot of um, this, just with the fit out, it's very small, very tight. The table's made from cosset, which is, again, plastic byproduct in that, made in Adelaide by Cosset Industries, and it's mixed with a little bit of sawdust. <clears throat> the, Lever on the chairs is, um, every time, it's, it's Angus skin tanned in Ballarat, Victoria's last tannery. And any, you know, if an animal runs along a barbed wire fence or, you know, gets, if, it, if the skin's not up to scratch, they t usually either throw them away. So they're the skins that I use for all the leather seating. And then we've just got latex padding underneath. This table has the whole tap system. So when you're sitting at the, at the communal table, you're actually sitting above, you know, a cider keg or a mineral water keg or, so everything in the fridges are all designed so that the, the crates just slide straight in. So it's designed around the crate. And then we've got all um, very low energy using appliances. Miele have got this incredible dishwasher that uses half the energy. Um, we've got induction cooktops and, you know, so we, we, I try and we've, we've got this amazing Uyghur coffee machine that uses half the energy of the conventional coffee machine. Um, that's it. You know, I saw the coffee, I was showing the coffee machine, yes, you've got to see this machine, it uses half the power. And when I saw it, it was the ugliest machine I'd ever seen. You know, it was, it looked like a UFO, you know. So the first thing I did is got a screwdriver and we took all the bits of plastic off and we found this really cool, you know, machine. So that's what we, our coffee machine is now, and now Uyghur's going to make them in Italy for us like that so we don't have to pull all the stuff off. <laughs> and, you know... <laughs> The guy, when he saw, the guy came out from Italy for the Food and Wine Festival, he actually came and he walked in and it, the look on his face when he saw his precious Uyghur green line, what have you done to my machine? <laughs> We've made it look cool. Anyway, it's taken him a year, but he agrees now that obviously, you know, this is the milk system. You know, the, this is bloody brilliant. I mean, these guys need to receive an order of Australia for creating this. If every cafe in Australia had this, we're talking about billions of bottles being saved. Um, you put your jug underneath it, senses it, and it senses the size of the jug through the thing, so it fills up automatically. So the guys are busy, they just put the jug under, they grab it, it's full. One's for skim milk, one's for uh, full cream milk. It's just, I think this is just brilliant. And this is the first one that they've um, installed, and I believe that they're, you know, I'm trying to get them to install one in Perth. I believe it's just going gangbusters for them, which is great. I think the National Australia Bank installed 13 of them in their new um, office tower. Great. So this onto the dehydrator, which is, I've, I've experimented, Jenny, my wife, is we're still paying off a Swedish in-vessel composting machine that costs us 50 grand that I just, yeah, I've just bought a machine for the Sydney greenhouse. It didn't quite work, but anyway, we're still, I've experimented over the last 10 years with so many ways of decomposing organic matter and right from even longer in the late 90s when I had a big worm farm that was, 
you know, got up to, I was feeding my worms 40, um, four truckloads of manure a week. So it got quite big. <laughs> so I know a lot about consuming organic matter. Well, up until now, there's two machines, but this is, the, the, this is one of them. So in, the, in, I think it's 1984, the South Korean government banned organic waste to landfill, just made it illegal. And what happened is a whole bunch of companies got up and, and created ways of dealing with this stuff. And most South Koreans have a little, like half the size of a dishwasher machine in their kitchen that just decomposes and, and dehydrates waste. This machine takes all our waste. We only use, this cafe is pretty busy and we create a fair bit of organic waste, but we only use it for half of its capacity. So it could be for a venue that probably has a thousand covers a day. It turns 100 kilos of rubbish into 10 kilos of compost in six hours. So what it does is it grinds it up and it basically heats it, so it cooks it. And from a grower's point of view or from a farmer's point of view, what is so good about that is it means that I can be confident in using it on the farm and not have weeds come up or not have to worry about pathogens or seeds, so it makes it safe. But it also means that it becomes incredibly rich I've used it in the last six months on rhubarb, I've grown potatoes, um, uh, spinach, all sorts of different things. And it's, what, we've, what we're finding is that, yeah, we need to use it a lot less. Like it's, so it's, it's much richer than what we originally thought it would be. Um, everyone from Shannon Bennett to Neil Perry is looking at these machines. I think they've sold quite a few since we installed this one. This was the first one that they've installed in Australia. But I'm really proud of the fact that we've had so many hospitality people through and just look at it and go, this just makes sense. Um, a good half of your waste from a restaurant is organic. And we can put oyster shells, bones, everything goes into it. So with cardboard boxes, um, although we don't have cardboard boxes, but our daily newspapers go into it. Um, and yeah, it just, and I love the fact that I, I get less and less each week because there's other people coming to collect it. So it's not just me using it on my farm anymore. There's a lot of people, even people that have got like rooftop gardens that are coming in and getting a crate just to mix with their potting mix and soil. And um, I was with Douglas on my farm yesterday and we dug up some potatoes and it's been hot and dry, but you know, the potatoes is full of worms. So the worms are still coming and eating the goodness in the soil, the food in the soil. So this dehydrator, yeah, has a massive impact and I hope that I mean, how good would it be if it, we banned organic waste going to landfill in Australia? I mean, we just, it just shows you that how quickly people will come up with solutions. And I think there's a good dozen companies in Korea that make these machines, all different ways and methods. And I think the biggest one they do ha has the capacity to take all the organic waste from, let's say, a hospital. So it's up to, I think it's 100 tonnes a day is their biggest machine. And the smallest machine they sell in, like, their version of Bunnings. So you can just go into a Bunnings in... I don't know if there is a Bunnings in South Korea, but you can go into a shop like that and buy a machine and take it home and plug it in and, you know, because it's, you're not allowed to put it. So it just, it's completely changed the culture over there. That's what it looks like. It has this amazing aroma. I was supposed to bring some this morning, but it smells like um, Christmas pudding. I mean, we've had people walk up and we've had to pack it away from the food counter because people, oh, what's this? I think Douglas has cooked up some, you know, chocolate brownie or something. <laughs> but it makes sense because we do so many orange juices and so much coffee grinds. So they go in and so that's, makes, that's the reason why it smells the way that it does. But yeah, you get 10 of those crates of rubbish make one crate. Just to give you an idea of how much rubbish gets reduced down in six hours to compost. And the compost is safe and it doesn't, it's, you know, it doesn't smell, the machine doesn't smell. We can put the, that dehydrator in the middle of the restaurant. How good is that? I think that's it. Am I 20 minutes? <laughs> uh, yeah, so I try and get guys like the chefs to encourage crops that, you know, like, so if you grow biodynamically, you're almost certainly practice biodiversity because you can't grow wheat year after year if you're doing it in a biodynamic way. So most of those guys are doing alternative crops or they're crop rotating or like Dale who grows our wheat in Perth, he's got four years of sheep, one year of wheat. So once every five years 
He's got 4,000 acres and he grows 800 acres of wheat, basically, yeah. yeah. Any more questions? So for this restaurant, it costs us, I think the dehydrator is about 40,000 and the milk system is about 15. Um, so you're probably looking at maybe 50,000 overall. You know, like the steel kegs for the milk, that's a $3,000 to buy good ones that we know are gonna last 20 years. So maybe $50,000. Well, people are spending $40,000 on an espresso machine now, a Slayer or, it just depends on what you value, I suppose, in a business and what you, yeah. I think it, the, the, to me it's just what, I wouldn't bother opening the business if we weren't doing that, you know. And I think we get a lot of people through the door because of it, so I think it pays for itself in that sense. What we tend to find in Perth is our food costs are lower, but our labour costs are higher because we're making everything. You know, the guys are making 80 kilos of butter a week. Um, that, there's a bit of work that goes into that. But then people come in especially because, you know, we get people coming in that just order bread and butter. They just, and I just smear this butter and I just love it, you know, because we've got this stone ground, you know, freshly made bread and that's what I would eat too. I, I, I get it. Does that answer it sort, sort of? Yeah. yeah. And, you know, at the moment it's really early days, but if you're a winemaker, it's 25% cheaper to sell wine kegged. Milk, I've worked out, is probably about the same, maybe even more. Um, mineral water is cheaper. At the moment, they're not. And, you know, we're not asking our suppliers to give us discounts because to me, I'd rather, you know, I want to, for them it's a new thing as well, you know, the, the, a lot of dairy farmers knocked us back. Simon Schultz loved the, the, the idea and just said, no, nah, I'm on board, I'll make this work. But uh, eventually I'm hoping that people will go, well, hang on, just, I don't have to buy all this shit, I don't have to buy all these boxes and packaging and so it's cheaper and that people will choose it and will you know, eventually we'll be rewarded with cheaper products. So, be, so it'll make economic sense as well. And, you know, guys like Frank Kimura at Movita, they're doing it anyway. They're telling their grocery suppliers, no, I want it in those black crates too, you know. Or, um, yeah, this, I can name so many restaurants that are saying, why, why am my staff having to deal with all this stuff? The, you know, ripping up boxes and then putting it in, you know, going out to the bins and, yeah, it's just... <laughs> I'm hoping that, yeah, the more people that do it, the cheaper it's going to get, which is the way that it normally works. Yeah. You mentioned the, uh, the seeds of the leather, the leather that was uh, sort of going to be normally as a waste. I'm just curious how you find, uh, how you manage to source and supply some with these things from these people. Obviously, you've got a little more clout than most people here to be able to get those things from No, not really. I mean, at, at Green Halls, they wouldn't have a clue who I am. <laughs> Um, I think they've been going since 1860, same family, and they're out, you know, out back of Ballarat. It looks like it's 1860 when you're there. <laughs> and <clears throat> I, ordered, I ordered 80 kangaroo skins, so what they were doing was rewarding, sh uh, you know, shooters and stuff. A lot of, um, there was a big, a lot of farmers were complaining about kangaroos. This is for the Perth Greenhouse, so three years ago now. I ordered the skins and it took them four weeks, they tanned them and they had them ready for the perf um, chairs. And I went to pick them up and as we're walking through, there's just shit everywhere, you know, and, and just see this whole pile of, of skins. And as we're walking through, I said, what are they? Are oh, they, you know, the, the, well, actually that, those skins were the, from the shoulder up. So it goes from four and a half millimetres to three and a half millimetres and people that use leather, they don't want that, they want the consistent thickness. So that gets cut off, it's got the, the, burn, the, brand, the number burnt into it. And I just saw this stuff and I went, fuck, this is, I don't know, I'd rather this. And they just had an order from Japan for 100 kangaroo skins. So they were wrapped at, you know, I didn't, so I walked out and instead of spending $12,000, I spent 1,000 bucks. And they couldn't believe me that I, sp couldn't believe that I spent 1,000, gave them 1,000 bucks. I said, no, no, you guys, I don't want you to look at it anymore as a byproduct. This is, you know, this should be used as well. And I walked out with like, yeah, enough leather to do hundreds of chairs. And people sit on them, they go, what's this? Oh, that's the, you know, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> we got time for one more question? One more? <coughs> um, do you think that the silo has been influenced um, consumers as much as it has? Like you've mentioned the Frank Kimura and um, different chefs in Melbourne. Yep. Yep, yeah, the 
definitely. I don't, that just works um, if you're busy. I mean, that's a whole capitalist competitive. You're busy and the place across the road is, or you're quiet and the place across the road is busy. What do you do? Well, you start adopting some of the stuff that they're doing across, across the road. And I'm, I think it just works that way, you know? So the busier we are, the more people will. And, you know, and there's a genuine, in the hospitality game, there's a genuine push. Melbourne seems to be, for some reason, I think this is the cluster of, of uh, hospitality players that really want to make it a sustainable business. And, you know, I think I've proven that the easiest place to start, it's easier to do it in a restaurant than it is to do it at home. I mean, how, you know, I've got this great little Callista biodynamic, milk, uh, biodynamic uh, market in, just up the road from where I live in Callista. And we've talked about bulk milk and, you know, the glass bottles. It's just, it's hard, you know, if you, to take milk home, you're going to have to take it home in a vessel of some sort. In a restaurant, it's easy. And it solves so many other problems. There's so many other problems solved along the way. And it solves problems for the suppliers. There's, yeah, there's people that lose out, but they're usually the people that I'm happy that they lose out. I'd rather the, the, milk, the, the guy who's farming makes more money. I'd rather the guy who's growing the wheat makes more money. I'm not that interested in the company in the middle that doesn't actually give a fuck about what they're feeding us anyway, you know? So, yeah. Thanks very much. Thank you.